Right, as promised, um, we're up to 152 and uh, people logging in seems to have slowed at least. Um, all four of us have had a chance to fix our hair and adjust our glasses in the two or three minutes that uh, we had there, having seen ourselves on camera for the first time. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first of Cornerstone's live events as part of its planning week. I hope lots of you have had the chance to uh, download and watch. Actually, you don't even need to download it. Just watch uh, our colleague Estelle's interview with Richard Buxton, which was released yesterday. Um, it's only half an hour. It's relatively lighthearted. It's extremely interesting. Well worth a watch. Um, you can watch that at any point. It's on the Cornerstone uh, website. Um, this morning's uh, event is is part one of a two-part case or update as part of the planning week. Part two, as you know, I hope is on Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. Um, but today's uh, part one is presented by um, a real crack team. Um, I I'm on there, but I don't count. I'm just saying hello to everybody. Uh, Ryan Coley, Emma Dring and John Fitzsimons, who's managed to spell his own name wrong. There's an S on the end of that. He's claiming it wasn't him. But um, anyway, there we are. Um, John Fitzsimons. Um, and, and there's the um, roster of things that are happening this week. I hope lots of you are able to log in to uh, lots of them. Um, you probably also know and will have received that there's a, a paper that goes with all of the talks. Each of the talks has a paper which goes into a bit more detail about um, the things that are being talked about. So well worth uh, having a look at that either before or, or after the, uh, the show. Um, I think that's all I need to say. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Emma in a minute to get going. Um, just before I do, please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A function on Zoom. We're all Zoom experts now, I'm sure, so you know what that means. Um, the team will try their best to answer those questions uh, either as we go along or, or hopefully if there's some time at the end. We're probably going to be about an hour, uh, but do, do stick your questions down on the Q&A function and we'll see if we can manage those as we go along. Um, so in which case I'm going to hand over to Emma, who's going to uh, start the um, discussion. Thank you, Joe. Good, good morning, everyone. Just managed to unmute myself in the nick of time there. I was about to start speaking on mute, the classic uh, Zoom error straight away. So I'm glad I've avoided that. Um, I'm going to kick straight off into my first case, which is the um, case of Dill. Supreme Court case um, from earlier this year. Um, really interesting case, possibly not an issue that's going to arise very often, um, but just some helpful helpful guidance from the, from the Supreme Court on kind of general tests. So the issue in this case was all around whether an appellant is allowed to argue that a listed building is not a building uh, in an appeal before planning inspector. Um, and then if so, how, how that issue should be approached. Now, of course, it's it's obviously um, it's usually pretty obvious when a bit whether an item is a building or not, um, which is why I say this this probably isn't an issue that will arise all that often. But having said that, um, you may be aware that Historic England has a, a selection guide all about garden and park structures, and the Supreme Court highlighted that in this case and made the point that there, there are actually a wide range of of statues and other kind of items that you find in gardens and parks. Um, that are listed and are, are considered to be um, listed in their own right. So um, it's probably around those kind of items that, that this issue will arise. The particular case um, of Dill was about two 18th century lead urns um, sitting on some limestone pedestals. Um, and they'd been moved a number of times in their history, but they'd ended up at Mr. Dill's grade two listed house. Um, and importantly, they were actually listed as, as listed buildings in their own right. So they weren't just pertinent structures which were included in the listing of the main house. So just briefly in terms of the facts, the background to all of this was that Mr. Dill had, had sold on these urns and pedestals. So they'd been removed from, from the house. Um, and I think in fact, he, he wasn't sure whether they'd even left the country or not. Um, he applied for retrospective listed building consent um, for that removal, but that, that was refused by the local authority, and they then served a listed, listed building enforcement notice requiring those urns and their pedestals to be reinstated. So um, there was an appeal, and in front of the planning inspector, Mr Dill 
uh, sought to argue that the urns and the pedestals weren't actually buildings. The upshot of that being that obviously they weren't subject to listed building control then, so he wouldn't have needed listed building consent to remove them, um, and there wouldn't be a power to serve a listed building enforcement notice. Essentially, he was saying they should never have been listed in the first place. Now, the inspector held that the status of those, those urns and pedestals as buildings was, was essentially conclusively determined by the fact that they were listed buildings. So he said Mr Dill couldn't go behind that. Um, and the High Court and the Court of Appeal had agreed with that. So essentially the position before the Supreme Court um, was that the challenge to the validity of the listing could only be by judicial review. Now, so there were, the, as I said, there were these two issues. The first issue was, was whether just as a matter of principle, Mr Dill was able to, to raise this kind of argument before a planning inspector. The Supreme Court dealt with this pretty quickly and, and said, yes, um, it was open to an appellant to argue that a listed item is not a building and therefore outside the scope of the Listed Buildings Act. Um, two key reasons, I think, for that. Firstly, the definition of a listed building itself is a building which is for the time being included in a list compiled by the Secretary of State. So the Supreme Court said clear from that that the item had to be both a building and on the list. And so if it wasn't a building, just being on the list wouldn't turn it into a building. And then secondly, um, and quite importantly, it was noted that contravention of a listed building enforcement notice is a criminal offence. Um, and so in the absence of any express statutory provision, fairness and the rule of law require that a person who is accused of, of an offence can raise any relevant defence. And there was nothing in the act that exp expressly excluded um, the ability to challenge the status of an item as a building. So, so the, the court there reinforcing um, the well-known case of Wicks and the, obviously a planning case, um, and the, the division between what you can and can't raise on an appeal and what you have to raise on a judicial review essentially depends on the statutory scheme. And in both the Town and Country Planning Act and the Listed Building Act, there are restrictions on challenging the validity of notices otherwise than through the statutory appeal process and the appeal grounds are very wide, so they were wide enough to encompass this issue that Mr Dill raised. Um, the second probably more interesting issue is if that, if that point is raised in an appeal or, or in an application, I suppose, um, how is one to decide whether the item in question is a, is a building or not? Um, and in this, uh, in this part of the judgment, the court noted that the definition of building in the Planning Act, which is obviously the, the principal act, um, which the Listed Building Act kind of refers to, that the same definition applies to both of those acts. And therefore, there was no reason to adopt any different approach than, than would be adopted in a planning case. So it was the well-known Skerritt's test, which that, that was developed to decide whether or not planning permission would be required for, for building operations. It's well, very well established. Um, and a threefold test considering size, permanence, and the degree of physical attachment and then it's a question of judgment for the decision maker balancing all of those factors and the court noted that um, the listed building act requires consent for works for demolition and that, that that envisages some form of dismantling or taking down and so that was seen as a sort of counterpart for the need for a kind of building operation when an item's put in place um, so items, um, there's no concluded view, unfortunately, reached on the urns. The court sort of gave us arguments both ways on that front and said the matter needed to go back um, before the inspector again um, for, for, for a final decision to be made on that. So, so no, no final conclusion on that, on that final point. So that's Dill, a really interesting case. I move on then to the, my, the next of my three cases, which is the Liverpool Open and Green Spaces. CIC and Liverpool City Council. Now, um, this was a case totally different, all about housing development in a green wedge, which was identified in the, the local plan for, for Liverpool. And the main issue in this case was around the interpretation of that policy, the green wedge policy. And there was a, a secondary argument about whether the section 66 duty in the Listed Buildings Act had been uh, lawfully discharged. Quite an unusual case as well, in the sense that this was actually a completely academic 
appeal by the time it got to the Court of Appeal, because as you can see on my slide there, the mayor had made this public statement that the scheme was dead. And also um, the council had given an undertaking to the court to say that it wasn't going to implement these permissions. Um, but nevertheless, the, the court thought there was some wider public interest in, in hearing the case, particularly because the policy covers a large area and there are similar policies in other plans. So um, the arguments before the court focused on the, the policy wording, which essentially, um, and I'm obviously paraphrasing here, said that the council would not permit proposals that would affect the pro predominantly open character of the green wedge. Now, the council saw that as, as being a qualified policy, um, something that wasn't intended to necessarily reflect national green belt policy, and that it was inherent within that policy that, that some, some level of harm would be acceptable and could still be consistent with the policy. Um, whereas the appellant was arguing that this, this concept of open character was essentially the same thing as openness in the framework, and therefore the policy on a true interpretation would give rise to a strong presumption against built development, um, which would harm openness. So these were the conflicting arguments before the court. And essentially the court agreed with the, the local authority and, the, and, and said that the local authority, authority had correctly understood and applied that policy. Um, and I think this case is interesting because it demonstrates really how critical it is to have a full understanding of not just the policy wording itself, but also the, com the, the national context in which it sits and also its relationship with other, with other policies in the plan. Um, the appellant was focusing on this concept of open character and essentially reading across the concept of openness from the framework. But the court emphasized that um, words don't always mean the same thing when used in different contexts. Even the same word can have slightly different meanings in different parts of, of policies. Um, and also the actual wording of the Green Wedge policy in this case differed quite significantly from the equivalent Greenbelt policy in the framework. For example, there wasn't the requirement for very special circumstances. There was no mention of very strong presumptions um, against development. Um, and then also importantly, the council actually had a separate policy dealing with the green belt, which was more restrictive than this green wedge policy. So again, as I, as I just mentioned earlier, it's important to understand how the policy that you're looking at fits in with other related policies in the plan and help you to understand um, what was actually intended and, and how the policy maybe ought to be interpreted. I think you know, the reality is it, it can be easier. It's easy, easy to say these things, but the reality of actually trying to interpret policies sometimes is not so straightforward and it's not always predictable how a judge is going to interpret the policy. Um, and in this case, of course, it's notable that the High Court had essentially reached the opposite view to the Court of Appeal on interpretation. So, you know, even highly qualified judges can get these things wrong. So not always so straightforward. The other thing I should mention before moving on um, to the next slide is that there is quite a useful summary in this judgment of the key principles on the concept of openness, kind of drawing from earlier authorities, which if you um, are faced with an issue having to determine impact on openness, um, that may be a helpful reference point for you to look at. I said that the second secondary issue in this case was about the Section 66 Listed Buildings Act um, duty. Um, and really very short, I'll be very short on that. Essentially, the point that was raised in this case kind of applies equally to any specialist consultee responses to a planning application. Um, basically, the council's internal heritage team had raised quite a strong objection to this proposal on a particular issue, um, which the planning officer writing the report to committee had taken a different view of. Now, obviously, the, there's a lot of cases about how the job of the person writing a committee report is to summarise matters and take a view on how much detail the committee needs. However, the court emphasised that where there's an objection from a consultee with a particular expertise, and particularly where planning officers formed a different view, that objection ought to be properly reported to the committee. Um, otherwise, they've essentially felt will be failing to take into account something that is a material consideration and I think particularly in cases involving heritage, um, you know, it's very important to be able to demonstrate that, that a, a local authority has gone through the right um, thought process in reaching any 
conclusion so important that the committee is presented with a full range of views as to potential harm. Now, my third case, uh, Wright and Forest of Dean, another Supreme Court case um, from earlier this year. And I think this, this, this case and deal, I think both demonstrate that it's, it's not only those big multi-million pound developments which, which make their way to the Supreme Court because this case it was just about a single wind turbine. Um, and in short, the money from some of the money from the operation of this turbine was going to be donated into a community fund each year for the project, projected life of the turbine. So I think that was about 25 years. And the Supreme Court had some evidence before it about um, similar funds elsewhere and the kind of community projects that, that they could fund. So examples were um, a village handyman service. Uh, maintenance of public defibrillators, a lunch club for elderly residents. So quite obviously all very worthy causes. Now the council um, took into account the benefits of this community fund when granting planning permission and indeed imposed a planning condition to, to secure those donations would actually be um, made going forwards. The issue for the court was whether the council had acted unlawfully in having regard to that donation. So was it actually a material consideration and was it lawful to impose a condition requiring that those donations be made? Now, the arguments mainly turned on the power to impose conditions and the Newbury criteria, which again, quite long standing um, principles there, which the test for imposing planning conditions, um, the threefold test, whether the condition serves a planning purpose, whether it fairly and reasonably relates to the development permitted and whether it's rational to impose that condition in a sort of Wensbury sense. Um, interesting, the Secretary of State intervened in this case to argue for a wider approach to planning purposes. So I think that's quite interesting. Um, but nevertheless, the court found that it, was un it had been unlawful to take account of that community donation because these, no matter how worthy the benefits were and this fund could be, at the end of the day, the payments had nothing to do with the character or the use of the land and, and the wind turbine. So that condition wasn't actually being imposed for a planning purpose. It was being imposed for other um, non-planning community related purposes. The Supreme Court reinforced here the long-standing principle that planning permission should not be sold. So it would be wrong to have regard to financial inducements, which have nothing to do with the planning merits of an application. And that is seen as important um, protection for both landowners um, and in terms of the public interest. Um, and finally, the court thought there was no reason to widen the scope of material considerations and also not appropriate to do so, given that there's a statutory basis for, um, for that test. So that's all I need to say. There's obviously more detail on all of those cases in the paper, um, but I'll now um, hand over um, and I'm not sure who I'm handing over to, but to the next um, case anyway, which is the Plan B case. Yeah, that's me, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to deal with three cases, two of which sort of look at climate change issues and one which looks a bit more at EIA. Um, we all got to choose the cases that we wanted to speak about for this um, case update. And for some reason, I chose cases that had huge amount of grounds and a huge amount of paragraphs in the judgments, but we've waded through them and um, we're going to start with Plan B Earth and most of you will know this case because it's was probably one of the most high profile cases of the year involving Heathrow Airport and the third runway at Heathrow Airport um, and of course there was a decision made pursuant to the ANPS policy that the government had set out under section 5 to um, allow for this third runway at Heathrow Airport. Emma could we go on to the next slide please? So um, the, it came before the divisional court last year uh, and there were numerous claimants with numerous grounds of challenge, um, but the um, grounds in, before the Court of Appeal um, focused on the Habitats Directive, the SEA Directive and climate change issues, in particular the Paris Agreement, and it was on that final issue that the uh, claimants were ultimately successful. Um, which merits the most uh, most consideration. But we'll first look at the, the how that it was, the court dealt with habitats and SEA. Um, the key issue in respect of the habitats directive was the fact that there was had been a rejection by the Secretary of State by um, of the Gatwick Airport scheme as an alternative to the Heathrow scheme. And of course, those of you who are familiar with the 
um, uh, Habitat Directive will know that the existence of an alternative means that a developer cannot rely on the existence of imperative reasons of overriding public importance to justify developments which would have an adverse effect on the integrity of sites protected by the directive. And so there was this debate about whether or not Gatwick was actually an alternative in these circumstances. And the court ha had said that Gatwick didn't, didn't comply with the hub objective, which was a central aim um, and was deemed genuine and critical to the UK's um, uh, ambitions as sort of having a hub status in London. Um, and as such, Gatwick wasn't a realistic alternative. Um, and so uh, it followed that while the um, objective of maintaining the UK's hub status had been a central aim, this was at all times the consistent view of the Secretary of State that the Gatwick Airport was not com um, compatible with that aim and therefore was open to the Secretary of State to not treat Gatwick Airport as an alternative um, in the context of the Habitats Directive. And to that, the claimant said, well, look, if you're treating um, Gatwick Airport, you're not treating Gatwick Airport as an alternative for the purpose of the Habitats Directive. How come you're treating it as a reason, as an alternative solution in the context of the SEA Directive? And the court said that inconsistency where they were treating it um, as an alternative in the context of the SEA Directive, but not in the context of Gatwick Airport, um, was uh, perfectly fine because the SEA Directive requires public consultation on the contents of environmental reports, which could not effectively be carried out unless there were reasonable alternatives put forward, whereas the Habitats Directive um, has no such duty. And so um, on the SEA Directive as well, that the court said there was no breach on the facts. It, that the Habitats and the SEA Directive's points are also just very interesting in the context of the standard of review that was applied. The court um, had a decided that there was a Wensbury unreasonable standard and that was contrary to what the appellants had argued citing EU case law which suggested there should be a, a more intense review standard um, but it, this case is sort of firmly established now that the standard of review in the context of these types of challenges will be Wensbury unreasonableness. If we go on to the next slide Emma, the uh, meat of this case in a sense um, and the reason that the claim succeeded was on the climate change issues points and essentially, it was a very straightforward argument, uh, namely that the government hadn't considered the Paris Agreement uh, in the context of making the decision under Section 5.8 of the Planning Act. Um, and of course, we know that the Paris Agreement enshrines a firm commitment um, to restricting the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius. Um, now, it was common ground that the Secretary of State hadn't actually taken into account the Paris Agreement. He had actually got advice not to take it into account because he had been focusing on the Climate Change Act 2008, which had a separate um, duty in Section 1, obliging him to ensure that net UK carbon account for the year 2050 was at least 80% lower than the 1990 baseline. And so what the court had to do was determine what is government policy for the purposes of Section 5.8, because the Secretary of State had an obligation to consider government policy in the context of making the ANPS decision. Um, and the court basically said, look, government policy um, are words of ordinary English language. They don't have a specific technical meaning, and they should thus be applied in their ordinary sense um, to the facts of a given situation. Um, and so in this context, the court was, was satisfied that the uh, clear commitments that the government had made by way of ministerial statements um, to the fact uh, that it was uh, signing up to the Paris Agreement was such that the Paris Agreement was government policy for the purposes of Section 5.8. Now, the claimants had said, well, look, if you're doing this, that will effectively mean that you're incorporating international agreements by the back door. And the court's answer to that was, was quite simple. They said, all we're asking you to do is interpret Section 5.8 in accord Parliament has drafted it. And um, they're not saying that you have to apply the Paris Agreement. They're just saying that you have to take it into account. And the Secretary of State had failed to do so. If we go on to the next slide, Emma. So having identified uh, that error of law, um, the court then turn to the issue of relief, which is also quite interesting in this case. And um, it's interesting for, for two reasons. First of all, um, if anybody's um, taking any challenges in the, in, in the higher courts in relation to 
these matters. They know that relief is often a hurdle that even if you've made out an error of law uh, in your claim, uh, you might fall at the, the, the Section 312A test. Um, the court had some very helpful things to say for claimants at, at paragraph 273 of the, of the judgment. And this is all, by the way, set out in the paper accompanying this. Um, but it, it talked about how um, if there's been an error of law, it will often be difficult or impossible for a court to conclude that it's highly likely that the outcome would not have been substantially different. And um, that's if the error of law was something to do with the decision making process. Um, but in this case, quite unusually, the court, even though it identified the error, error of law and agreed that there should be relief, it decided not to quash the ANPS and instead it granted a declaration. And that was quite odd um, also because the appellants had sought a quashing order um, and the Secretary of State had basically not made any submissions as to what relief should be granted. Um, um, but of course, Heathrow Airport Limited itself had said that um, the, the ANPS shouldn't be quashed. And the court didn't really give reasons for why it didn't quash. It, it made a reference to the fact that because of the conclusions it made on the SEA directive and the Habitat directive grounds, which of course didn't go in the claimant's favour, that it wouldn't it wouldn't merit quashing the ANPS. But but to be honest, uh, there's sort of a, a little bit of confusion about why it, it actually didn't go so far as to quash the ANPS, given that it had um, very clearly stated that the Paris Agreement should have been taken into account and wasn't. Um, those who've been following this case may be aware that Heathrow Airport Limited appealed uh, the judgment and it became before the Supreme Court just um, last month on the 7th and 8th of October. Uh, their focus was on this Paris Agreement ground. I think it might have been the only ground, in fact, that they, they got permission to appeal on and essentially arguing that the Paris Agreement isn't government policy for the purposes of Section 58 of the Planning Act and that therefore the government had no obligation to take it into account. Um, there are detailed pleadings from this case, which I'd, um, I've put a link to in the paper uh, um, on Plan B's website. So they have all of the pleadings from the Divisional Court, the Court of Appeal, and indeed the Supreme Court, if anybody's interested in, in reading further on this. But very interesting things, I think, in this case, both on um, the relevant considerations points, um, but also on uh, the question of relief. If we go on to the next case, Emma, please. Uh, so this case, Client Earth, we're back in the High Court with this case, um, and this was a um, application by Drax Power Limited, a power company, for a development consent order for a national um, significant infrastructure project, an NSIP. And it was essentially the construction and operation of two gas-fired uh, generation units at Drax Power Station in North Yorkshire. And the application was referred to a panel appointed by the Secretary of State, and she, of course, uh, the panel, of course, considered it and uh, in the end rejected uh, the proposal. Um, they essentially distinguished between the need for energy NSIPs in general and the need for this particular development. And then as a result of applying the balancing exercise in Section 1047 of the Planning Act, uh, they said that the adverse impacts of the development, particularly the, the emission of GH of greenhouse gases, outweighed the benefits. Um, the interesting thing about this is the Secretary of State uh, disagreed. So she overturned uh, the decision, um, particularly focused on the fact that um, national need um, outweighed the significant adverse um, environmental impacts. And so the challenge brought by the claimants in this case, Client Earth, uh, focused on the interpretation of EN1 and EN2 and their legal effect on the application of a DCO. Um, if we go to the next slide, Emma. Uh, this case is also interesting, though, before I go on to the re the, those aspects of the challenge, um, because uh, Mr. Justice Holgate elucidates um, some of the relevant considerations uh, test that was put forward by um, Lord Carnwith and Samuel Smith in his last Supreme Court judgment, a case I think that Richard Ground QC is going to talk about later this week. Um, and so what the, the court set out in respect of relevant considerations at paragraphs 99 to 100 uh, that will apply to all sorts of planning cases is that when there's a challenge in respect of a failure to take into account of a relevant consideration, it's insufficient for a claimant simply to say that the decision maker did not take into account a legally relevant consideration because a decision maker does not fail to take a relevant consideration to account unless he was under an obligation to do so. So there has to be some obligation or the consideration was so obviously material that it was irrational not to have taken it into account. 
So I think for those um, who are both defending and um, bringing challenges along the lines of relevant considerations, these paragraphs 99 to 100 um, of Mr. Justice Holgate's judgment uh, are, are sort of the type of paragraphs you'd want to be um, copying and pasting into your grounds as you go forward. Um, and as a result of, of, of his findings, Mr. Justice Holgate said, well, the Bolton principles, which have been uh, previously set out by Glidewell J, um, principles two and six are no longer uh, good law. And I've set those out in the paper. If we go on to the next slide, Emma. So in relation to um, the actual grounds of challenge in this case, um, Mr. Justice Holgate was very clear that the um, EN1 policy has to be read as a whole and not selectively. Uh, and as a result of it reading it as a whole, he said the panel was wrong to, to suggest that there needed to be um, some assessment of quantitative need um, rather than just simply qualitative need. And so um, he said that the panel and indeed um, the uh, claimants were misinterpreting EN1 when they suggested that the panel should be looking at quantitative need. Um, and the Secretary of State was right to simply say uh, that all she needed to, to look at was qualitative need. Uh, and as a result, there was no heightened obligation on the Secretary of State to give reasons for departing from the panel's view, because in this circumstance, the panel had misinterpreted EN1. Uh, and, and so she was perfectly entitled to depart from their views without giving, giving particular reasons. And similarly, that the Secretary of State um, did not treat uh, the greenhouse gas emissions as having no weight in the balance. The claimants had argued that the Secretary of State simply hadn't considered um, greenhouse gas emissions or had, had given them uh, uh, no weight. And on the facts of the case, Mr. Justice Holgate said, well, that simply wasn't, wasn't borne out. If we go on to the next slide. And so then the final issues are, are grounds of challenge. The Secretary of State um, essentially had been legally entitled to reject the panel's approach and give substantial weight to the, to the generalized need case uh, for this type of power. And it was a matter of planning judgment for the Secretary of State not to give greater weight to the greenhouse gas emissions. There were two other challenges in respect of the EIA regs um, and in respect of a duty of fairness. Um, and I've set those out in detail, I'm just conscious of the time, set those out in detail uh, in the paper um, as to why they failed as well. Now, this case has been appealed to the Court of Appeal. Um, so I, I assume the Court of Appeal will have an opportunity to grapple with Mr. Justice Holgate's very long uh, judgment. Um, but I think uh, for those of you looking to take something from this case, what I would particularly emphasize um, is that, that rele those relevant considerations paragraphs at 99 and 100 are the type of paragraphs that will apply to any um, planning case, uh, planning judicial review case where relevant considerations are, are raised. So do please bear them in mind when you're uh, drafting or defending uh, cases. If we go on to the next final case, Emma, please. Um, finally, just looking at Kenyon, um, this was uh, quite an ordinary case, really. I think mis um, this was in the Court of Appeal and uh, Lord Justice Coulson gave the, the lead judgment. Um, and this was a judicial review of a screening direction given by the Secretary of State in respect of a residential development proposal of 150 houses. Secretary of State had concluded it wasn't EIA development. And it's particularly interesting because of the way the Court of Appeal demonstrates the difficulties that claimants have in bringing challenges in relation to the EIA regulations. Um, so the appellant had requested an EIA screening direction from the respondent in light of concerns about air pollution levels associated with this um, 150 house planning permission. And the Secretary of State concluded the proposed development simply it wasn't EIA um, on the basis it wasn't likely to, to give, of course, significant effects um, on the environment or likely to have significant effects on the environment. And it followed there was no environmental statement required. Uh, and the challenge came before Mrs. Justice Lang in the High Court and she um, rejected it. And so the appeal focused on uh, the questions around the evidential basis for the Secretary of State's conclusions and uh, this, the, the arguable failure to take a precautionary approach. Um, looking at the first of those, um, the court had some very interesting things to say about these types of challenges. Um, the Mr. Justice or Lord Justice Coulson noted that claimants really have an uphill task when they're trying to argue and that there was no evidential basis for a finding of no likely significant effects. And he said that the reason for this, um, and the reason it's even more difficult, 
is because in the context of a screening direction, that's a really preliminary broad-based assessment of environmental impacts undertaken by those with relevant training and expertise. And as such, um, you're really going to have to go some to identify um, how they haven't uh, properly taken into account evidence. He um, trotted out the very familiar phrase to those of you who um, are defending or bringing claims in the planning court, the accusation of nitpicking, he said he agreed with uh, Mrs. Justice Lang's characterization of the claim as nitpicking. Um, and he said the decision maker is not required to set out all of the information and statistics in relation to the decision, um, which is, of course, just a continuation of the type of case law we've been seeing from the planning court for some time now. Uh, and as such, on the evidence in this case, there was suffi sufficient evidential basis for the, um, for the Secretary of State to conclude uh, that there were no likely significant effects and that it wasn't therefore uh, something that merited uh, EIA or an environmental statement and this wasn't EIA development. If we go on to the final slide, uh, the, the case is also interesting because of the approach taken in relation to the precautionary principle. Um, those of you will be familiar with the precautionary principle from cases like Loader and of course it's in the 2011 EU directive in Recital 2 um, and what the appellant argued was essentially that there was an inevitable uncertainty in respect of the air pollution question and that meant that there needed to have uh, the, the Secretary of State needed to have regard to the precautionary principle but Lord Justice Coulson said that was that was misconceived and um, he reiterated how the precautionary principle will only apply if there is a reasonable doubt in the mind of the primary decision maker Okay, so you're looking at the, and that's, that comes from the Evans case for where Lord Justice Beetson set that out. Um, so you're looking at whether there's a reasonable doubt in the mind of the primary decision maker as to whether the precautionary principle can apply. And uh, Lord Justice Coulson emphasized how it's contrary to the principle outlined to argue that merely because somebody else had taken a different view to that of the primary uh, decision maker, um, it cannot be said that there was no reasonable doubt. Uh, so really, again, focusing on whether there was reasonable doubt in the mind of the primary decision maker. And on the facts of this case, uh, Mr. Lord Justice Coulson said, the evidence suggests there was no reasonable doubt in the mind of the Secretary of State, and thus there was no room for the precautionary principle uh, to operate. So, so this case really shows that EIA challenges, again, to these high level um, screening directions or screening opinions, really, really difficult to mount, not impossible. We saw there was a case, the case of Swire, earlier this year where, where that did succeed, but still very, very difficult to mount and, and something to bear in mind uh, if you're taking such challenges or indeed defending them. Um, I think I'll hand over to Ryan then to look at uh, his three cases. Thank you very much, uh, John. So I've got three cases that I want to talk to you all about. Um, the first concerns the significance of um, uh, ones have a dual purpose permitted development, uh, uh, what it means to try and take advantage of a dual purpose when implementing a permitted development right. And the second two cases concern the HS2 project. So the first one, New World's payphones and Westminster City Council. Um, New World payphones were a, uh, or are a telecoms operator for the purposes of the Communications Act 2003. They wanted to use um, their permitted development rights under Part 16, uh, Class A of Schedule 2, uh, to replace two traditional telephone booths, if you like, with one of these new style, multifunctional uh, digital telephone kiosks. Now, it was said that the kiosk would have all the functionality of a, an ordinary telephone kiosk, but also have an internally illuminated digital advertisement panel. So that's the dual purpose that I was referring to. to. It had the purpose, as you would expect, uh, of ordinary telephone and telecommunications functionality, but so had the second purpose, um, so the local authority contended, uh, of advertising. New World Payphone's position was that actually this is part and parcel of the same thing. The telephone kiosk incorporated the advertising panel and really the two things were inequally linked. So the challenge for the uh, local authority, ultimately the um, High Court and then the Court of Appeal, was to really unpick and think about whether looking at the terms of the permitted development rights, it could be said that uh, this was a dual purpose 
um, or whether uh, it fell within the terms of um, the PD right. So let's look at the, the PD rights specifically. Um, as I said, it's um, uh, part, part 16 class A, which provides that development uh, on or by half, or on behalf of, a, of an electronic code operator for the purpose of its network um, consists where it consists of the installation, alteration, or replacement of any electronic communications apparatus. It is permitted, and electronic communications apparatus found in the Communications Act 2003 as including structures or things designed or adapted for use in connection with the provision of an electronic communications network. Now, structure, um, in accordance with subsection two, includes a building, and this is the key part, only if the sole purpose of that building is to enclose other electronic communications apparatus. Now, it was common ground before the Court of Appeal the telephone kiosk was in fact a building and therefore a structure within the meaning of subsection two, if and only if its sole purpose to enclose other electronic communications apparatus. Now it was argued before the appeal that the advertisement display panel was simply an ancillary part or otherwise incidental to the electronic communications apparatus, local authority, uh, obviously disagreed. Um, the Court of Appeals judgment was given by Lord Justice Hickenbottom, who held that if a developer wants to take advantage of PD rights, then the proposed development must fall entirely within the scope of the right relied upon. It's no good having a dual purpose. Um, mixed use developments cannot take advantage uh, of the right um, because the right therefore be used for something outside of its scope. Um, and then analyzing this particular case, absent the advertising panel, the development would have fallen within the relevant right, but the fact that the advertising panel uh, existed meant that the right had a, a dual purpose. So if we can move to the next slide, please, Emma. Um, the key to understanding the significance of the Court of Appeals decision is really here, that where a proposed development has a dual purpose, so in this case, the use of advertising and use uh, as a, a structure to house electronic communications equipment, it will not be permitted where the right permits of one purpose only. And that's why I say the significance is not limited to telecoms cases. The purpose of the proposed development is what matters um, and whether or not the purpose falls within uh, the relevant qualifier right will be the question that uh, requires focus. So the whole of any proposed development must fall within the scope of any particular right within Schedule 2 of the GPDO. And that's why it's important to, to realise that this really isn't a case limited to telecoms. It does have a wider significance. And so when you're advising on um, the use of permitted development rights more generally, if the development that you're advising upon has a dual or mixed use purpose, then think twice about whether it can really fit within the relevant right. New World's um, payphones rather suggests um, that it, does, it, has, it has to have a sole purpose and a sole use and mixed use, um, uh, unless mixed use developments, unless they fall within the terms of a particular right, uh, will not be permitted. So that's the first case. The second two cases um, I want to talk to you about are uh, concern. HS2. Now, many of you will be familiar with the broadcaster and environmentalist Chris Packham from The Really Wild Show. Um, he very valiantly brought a challenge to the government's decision to proceed with HS2 after the review that many of you will, will remember was launched by the government earlier this year. Um, next slide, please, Emma. The challenge was really to the macro political decision making, and that, that's the key to understanding the significance of this case. The court identified very quickly that what Mr. Packham was challenging was really that political decision to continue with the HS2 project uh, following uh, the non statutory review. And the way that he formulated his case was to say that having undertaken that review, the government then misunderstood or ignored environmental concerns when it made its final decision to continue with the project um, and or it failed to take into account the commitment of net zero by 2050 uh, following the Paris Agreement. So those were the two bases on which 
um, the challenge was launched. And can we have the next slide, please? Um, now, many of you will know HS2, if fully constructed, will be a high-speed rail link that connects London, Birmingham, uh, Manchester, and Leeds, so a very substantial piece of national infrastructure. Um, its construction is envisaged in phases um, under Acts of Parliament, giving the necessary powers for the construction and operation of each phase. So um, the project isn't going through the normal planning system. Acts of Parliament are authorizing each phase of the project. Um, on the 21st of October, uh, on the 21st of August last year, you will remember that the um, Secretary of State for Transport announced a review uh, of the project in, in light of its costs and in light of um, lots of commentary uh, about its usefulness. That review was concluded in February this year and a report was submitted. Having considered that report, the Prime Minister announced that the government uh, would continue with the project. And if we can have the next slide. The um, first limb of the challenge, which is the misunderstanding or ignoring of local concerns, um, was a macro political decision according uh, to the Court of Appeal. So um, that's where a low intensity review is applied um, in accordance with Wensbury principles. And it's the sort of decision that the government is entitled to a broad measure of discretion. You, you, we see this now with Wensbury, um, courts taking um, a nuanced approach depending on the subject matter of the challenge at hand. So here where we have a nationally important uh, decision that's being taken at a macro political level about whether to continue with uh, a project such as HS2, the court says, we're gonna take a light touch, low intensity. And the reason for that is, well, that this was a decision really taken at the highest level of government and was largely a matter of political uh, rather than planning judgment. And in arriving at its decision to continue with HS2, um, the cabinet must have been aware that phase one included a detailed assessment of environmental impacts, and there had been no change um, in the circumstance surrounding the, surrounding the environmental impacts since that date. What the government had to do was to balance a number of uh, significant and, and competing political, economic, social and environmental consider considerations, all of which had to be um, balanced. And the court identified that it's really the sort of, of decision where there was no single right answer. A decision either way would have been um, reasonable. So the challenge really missed the mark because it was attacking the government's political decision to continue, but put in the guise of its misunderstanding or ignoring local concerns where actually all of those concerns had very carefully been taken into account um, during the first phase of the project. And, and during the review, the government was really looking forward, um, thinking about a number of factors as to whether um, the project should continue. So we've moved to the next slide and look at limb B of the challenge. Limb B of the challenge, um, was a failure to take into account the commitment in the Paris Agreement. And this touches upon um, Plan B, the Plan B Earth case that John was talking to you about. The thrust of the argument in this case relied very much on the Plan B Earth type argument. And that argument was run to essentially say, well, look at the way the government dealt with the third runway at Heathrow. Um, in that case, it, it was decided that the government had not taken into account um, the uh, commitments uh, from the Paris Accord when uh, the ANPS was designated in June 2018. Um, but that, of course, was one year before the Climate Change Act, which was amended to reflect the Paris Agreement, and the HS2 review specifically took into account the government's net zero target for 2050. Um, the review was also quite frank uh, in its acceptance that during the construction phase, carbon emissions would be pushed up for much of the period before 2050. But the aim was a strategic one to promote modal shift. So by facilitating a better rail network, it pushes us all out of our cars onto the rail network, or, or so is the idea. The idea that that will have a major impact in delivering on the net zero carbon um, target. So the overall conclusion was one of um, taking into account 
um, the increases of harm during the construction phase, but the overall modal shift materially contributing to the 2050 um, net zero carbon emissions target. So again, that second limb of challenge um, failed. So if we move on to the next uh, slide, the next slide concerns the case of um, Hillingdon. Um, Hillingdon brought a challenge against the Secretary of State for Transport and State for um, Communities and Local Government. And, and the significance of this case uh, is really interesting because it's the courts recognizing that notwithstanding all those macro political arguments that I've just been talking to you about, there are legitimate bases on which local authorities um, can get involved with the HS2 project, have their say, um, and insist on certain standards um, being reached. So in this case, Hillingdon appealed against the decision of the Secretary of State um, and the High Court that it had erred in refusing to approve certain plans and specifications relating to the HS2 project, um, which it had um, uh, refused to approve in accordance with its statutory obligations. Um, and as I say, the importance of the case really, ra uh, really lies in establishing the extent to which local planning authorities have control over aspects of the HS2 project. If you can have the next slide, please. Um, on the 20th of March, 2018, Hilling used to grant an approval uh, request made by HS2 Limited for these plans and specifications, which related to um, uh, proposed works with a wetland habitat ecological mitigation for the Colne Valley uh, viaduct. Um, actually, this case was all about the impact of works on archaeology and the dispute related to the failure by HS2 to submit any information or evidence which would enable the local planning authority to perform their statutory duty in evaluating those plans and specifications for their impact on the archaeological uh, remains that were at uh, this site. So in essence, had HS2 demonstrating it, demonstrated it was doing enough to preserve the impact on a um, significant site for archaeology. The planning inspector, when it came to determine uh, this matter, recommended that Hillingdon's refusal be upheld, but that decision was called in by the Secretary of State and the decision of the inspector was uh, reversed uh, on appeal to the High Court. Mrs. Justice Lang dismissed the appeal and appealed onward to the Court of Appeal. If we have the next slide, please. So the, the legal context in which um, we're operating here is Schedule 17, the High Speed Rail West London, uh, London to West Midlands Act 2017. And that contains a specific power for the local plan to refuse an approval request where the design or external experience, the external appearance of the works ought to and could really be modified to preserve a site of archaeological or historic interest. So there was a specific power um, that Hillings had where it could refuse external appearance or design matters. Uh, uh, insisting on such modification um, was necessary to preserve a site of archaeological or historical interest. And performing that evaluation required the exercise of planning judgment, um, where design measured the risk to archaeology, and that in turn informs that assessment of whether there is a need for mitigation or mitigation or modification uh, measures. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see the way that it played out in court. So how does Schedule 17 operate? Uh, well, the court held that the planning authority is under a statutory duty to perform an evaluation of the impact uh, of the submitted plans and democratic responsibility and accountability rested with the local planning authority uh, who were addressing themselves to matters of local concern. HS2, however, argued that the environmental minimum requirements that it had contractually agreed with the Secretary of State really had the effect of ousting any discretion that local authority had under Schedule 17. And it backed up that argument by saying that um, there was statutory guidance uh, which warned local planning authorities not to modify or replicate uh, the controls already in place. Um, but the court held that the guidance um, that effect of stripping the local authority uh, of its powers and duties 
uh, imposed by um, statute. So we move to the next slide. Um, and we are on to the questions and answer session. I should just say before we do that, uh, there was a couple. There were a couple of queries about where materials can be obtained for today's uh, webinar. Those are on the events page of our website. Uh, you can download materials there. Um, I haven't been able to keep an eye on the questions as I've been speaking, but um, John and Emma, are there any questions that we need to address at this stage? Um, and if there aren't, I'd invite any of you to submit them now. Anything we've, we've talked about uh, today, any of the cases that you've, you've heard about. Um, there's no questions at this stage, Ryan. Um, and obviously we're coming up to the hour mark. So um, we might finish up. What I would say to everybody who is uh, watching is that if you'd like um, more material, um, there's uh, 2 p.m. today, uh, is net zero still cool with Estelle Dehan and um, Michael Bedford QC. And then we've been very accommodating for everyone who wants to stay up late and watch the US election tonight because uh, there's no, no webinars tomorrow morning, uh, but then the next webinar will be at 2 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. So you can have a lie-in tomorrow morning and then watch the um, regeneration panel discussion at 2 p.m. tomorrow. All those details about um, other webinars as well on Thursday and Friday um, are also on the website. Uh, you should all by this stage have the papers associated with planning day. If you haven't received those papers, please just email um, events at cornerstonebarristers.com, which is on the screen. Uh, I don't have anything further to add, Ryan or Emma, do you? No, thank you very much for joining us. It really is a pleasure to be able to see some of our clients virtually, or at least talk to them virtually um, during this, uh, what's going to be second period of lockdown. We, we are going to continue our um, uh, webinars uh, throughout the month. No doubt there'll be further programmes for the rest of the year. But thank you very much for joining us and thank you for being part of the planning. Thank you. Thank you.